Okay. I hope I can move around a little bit, can you I? Can't look. We'll do whatever we <laughs> yeah. have to do, don't worry. Yeah. I'm not um, sitting for a painting. <laughs> so, clap. Hi, this Hi. is Stephen Palmer and Richard Bentley. Right. This is February 1st, 2018. That's right. And we're at Richard's apartment uh, in Greenwich Village, and we're here to talk about Stonewall and the, oh, uh, God. that period of time around it. So many years. <laughs> Hey, uh, Richard, um, why don't we start out with you just giving a sense of your background, where you're from, your family, religion. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I was born and brought up in Boston, Massachusetts, actually Roxbury. Uh, very, uh, I'm a Depression baby, born 1931, big family, seven children, Roman Catholic, and... Uh, Went to public schools most of my life, except when I got to high school, I ended up in one of the better Catholic high schools, Boston College High School. Uh, and from there, uh, I went into, during the Korean War, I was, uh, I joined up and into the Air Force. Spent four years in the Air Force. I went to Korea for a year. Didn't see combat as such. Got there just after the um, the um, peace was signed, so to speak. It wasn't it's not even a peace. The armistice. The armistice, right? And that's still going on to this day. With we still a state of war with them, um, and spent the whole year there. Was uh, was uh, an awakening to see what the world was. Uh, it's not the Korea we know today. It was all mud huts and real poverty when, um, at post-war. It was 1954, and I came back to the States, spent another year uh, in the Air Force uh, on Cape Cod. And uh, when I got out of the service, I, I had the GI Bill to go to school, which without it I would never have been able to do. As I said, <clears throat> my mother was widowed very young with the seven kids, so there was nothing there to get to college in those days. But the GI Bill saved it, and I was, I was the first in my family to go to college. And the only one, it seems, so far. Um, and uh, graduated Boston College and majored in accounting. Accounting? Accounting, yeah. And uh, I came to New York only for... Uh, I, when I look back on why I came to New York, I thought I was coming to New York because... Uh, I know I wanted a new experience, and uh, they were offering like four hundred dollars more than the new, than the Boston office of the company was offering. So I decided to go to New York. I think down deep, when I in retrospect, it was because I was gay, and I wanted to escape the com the confinement of family and relatives and have a little more freedom coming to New York. That's when, with retrospect, I look back, and it makes much more sense now, because in those days, uh, talking about 1960, was when I graduated college, it was still, still ironclad closets, and uh, to get away from any embarrassment that might happen. Um, up until that time, my gay life was very secretive. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit, if you would. Um, how old were you when you first recognized something was different? I think I always knew it. Was, I was a very young boy. I'm talking about six, seven, eight years old when I had an encounter with another boy uh, sexually. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing, but it really excited me. I remember that. And I don't think he was much older than me. But he was the prime mover, not me. So I have a feeling he might have been a couple of years older than me. And uh, I know I lived with the guilt of that for so many years. Irish Catholic guilt. Uh, and uh, let me see, from then on... Uh, can, I, can I ask you about that guilt? Um, had homosexuality, the term, ever been mentioned around you at all? It's funny you should mention that. I never knew the word, I guess I knew the word homosexual, I'm not sure. But uh, I remember 
uh, my mother used to have, never knew what the term was. There was no term for it. And my mother, my mother talk, talking about uh, a fellow used to come, uh, a, a man who come around uh, with the, uh, they used to come around with these house like a Tupperware party, only he sold brushes and that type of cleaning. Stanley cleaning, I think it was Stanley. And he used to come around and all the women of that age would get a, have a party around it and they'd come and they'd cook and all get together. And he was as gay as a goose, but they didn't have a word for it. And he would say, ladies, you do this and you do that and you do this. And there was so, I remember my mother saying, they would talk about him, Mr. So-and-so. They all loved him. They just loved him. They thought he was so sweet, so nice. And he was, uh, he was going to say man in his 40s at the time. And uh, that's how I remember. But I remember my mother's expression for it. She said, you know him, Mr. So-and-so. He's so nice. You know him. You know, he's chased me. I'm a butterfly. Chase me, I'm a butterfly. Chase me, I'm a butterfly. See, it's the only term she had. The only other term I ever knew up to the was a fairy. I knew that. I knew the term fairy. And funny, I collected that painting from a thrift shop over there because that's how my mother expressed it. You know how he was, chase me, I'm a butterfly. And that, that sort of uh, uh, explains it to me. Every time I look at that, I think of my mother saying, chase me, I'm a butterfly. She was, there was nothing prejudiced in her. They loved it and they, they didn't think anything of it. And <clears throat> So what, what, how did I get onto that subject? I asked you um, what about the guilt association. Oh yeah, the guilt. Um, and, and because you did feel guilty. Oh yeah, well that's, that was, as I say, Catholic guilt. Irish Catholic guilt. Uh, as I said, there was really no name for it as I mean, growing up. In fact, I used to try to tell it. The first time I told it in confession, the priest was shocked. <laughs> and that was the last time I ever mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. What did he say? He said, all I can remember him saying, you did what? <laughs> well, I think I forget the term. I think I said, I said something like, uh, I put my mouth, you put your mouth on it? <laughs> uh, and I remember saying, and that, that scared the hell out of me. I was about 14 or 15 years old in high school then. And we were required, but that was the guilt that made me, I was trying to get rid of this guilt in confession. That didn't help. <laughs> Do you remember how many Hail Marys he made you say? No, I have no idea. That, no. that wasn't the issue with me. The issue was, oh, actually, to me, I it did get rid of that guilt because I was carrying that from the time I was about seven years old to the time I was about 15, 16, whatever that was. And it was really gnawing at me. Because I didn't know I was gay at that. All I knew was that that was wrong. Mm, that's all I knew. It's interesting, right? Yeah. It's, it, nobody ne necessarily mentions anything specifically. Oh, no. It's ne although, the funny thing is I grew up, I should mention this, because when I grew up, I was always called, not always called sissy, but whenever we played as young people, five, six, seven years old, the common thing was, let's play house. And when play house... I wanted to be the mother. I didn't want to dress, although I, I, my only thing in dressing, if you want to say drag in those days, was putting on high heels. And that was because I liked the clip clop and it made me taller. But other than that, there was never any drag to it as such. I never wanted to go anything beyond the high heels. But I think that's so common even to this day in little kids putting on clippity clop high heels. And, but I always wanted to be the mother. <laughs> Did the folks you were playing with, the other kids? Yeah, yeah. That? No, not the other kids, the adults. No, it was my father. My father was an old Victorian. I stretch. He died very young. He died when I was 10 years old. So, but I do remember him being a strict disciplinarian. And I, I only remember him just vaguely using the term sissy. Sissy, the type of thing. And the thing like that, I want to be the mother. He called you a sissy. He, he would refer, he didn't call me directly to it, but talk about that's, that's sissy to do things like that. He didn't, he didn't say, you are a sissy. And, but I was conscious of it after a while. Um, but not too bad. And, but uh, as I got older, uh, uh, it wasn't even, it was pre-teens. There were some people in the, 
neighborhood who are very, my father wouldn't let even my brothers go near them because their attitude towards sex and, and that type, and their language was just so to me, but that would turn me on. I would hear that nasty language and I would get turned on by it. Yeah. And they turned me, and there was, there was one of the older fellows who, who spotted my tendencies. I know that much. And, Could you and, talk more about that? What did you? What do you think he spotted, and how did he respond? Well, you know, well, he had heard it was one of his younger brothers that I had had that incident when I was about five or six years old, and his younger brother must have told his older brother because uh, I remember he tried to entice me once in the basement of the house, but I wouldn't go along with it. You know. Remember, he tried to entice me. And every time he saw me, he would try. I got an inclination. I knew what he was after. And I didn't like it. I didn't like it at that. Um, that was more my conscience than anything that was, was more dominant than the, the sexual desire. I wasn't, I wasn't sexual at that point. In fact, I can say for myself, sexually, I did not mature until I was well over 18. I mean, just barely before that. Uh, I remember going to high school. I was very underdeveloped compared to the fellows I was in high school with. Number one, I was uh, very tiny. I was probably uh, four feet 10, four feet 11 in high school. I have pictures of me. I look at pictures of me. I say, I can't believe. I look like I'm 10 years old and, I, and I'm in high school. And uh, I was always that way. In fact, even when I'm in the service, uh, I was rejected trying to enlist in the service twice for being undeveloped. And I was 18, 19 years old. I was undeveloped physically. I didn't have any body hairs as such. And uh, finally, I was almost 20, 21 when I finally did go in the service before I had fully physically developed. And I think that's also sexually. I developed very slowly. But over the years, that became an advantage. <laughs> when I was 30, I could pass for 21. Oh, gotcha. When I was 40, I could pass for 30. <laughs> and so I lived in, today. I think that's why I'm living as long as I am now. I never expected to be this old. Right, and you don't look your age. Oh, well, I'm 80, 86 years old, yeah. And uh, I, I don't know whether that's part of it or not, but all my life has been like that. It's like I've been behind <laughs> all the time. Mm. Could you talk a little bit more about um, your family life, your um, brothers and sisters and mom and dad, what, your, your relationship with your brothers and sisters? What do you think? Uh, well, basically my, my family, as I said, there were seven children, and my mother was widowed. I mean, my, my father died in 1942, uh, so he was just barely 48 years old. So my mother was widowed with seven children, the oldest being 21, and I was 10, and the youngest was four. So there's, there was almost there's 16 years between the oldest and the youngest. And uh, so, but there were two generations within the family, so to speak. I always call them the pre-war and the post-war children. Mm. Uh, I had three brothers older than me and one sister older than me. And when my father died, most of them were teenagers or older children. So they were 21, 18, 17, 16 years old. Then I came down, I was 10. So the, and I was 10 years old, we were still a boy where they were teenagers and older. In fact, my older brother and sister were able to work. And that, that helped my mother because in those days, there was no welfare as such. Although she was the, she was the wife of a, a veteran of World War I. And so she did get some kind of benefit as a veteran's wife. But that was all there was. And, uh, there was a lot of kids. Yeah, a lot, not, uh, but, and it was still the Depression for all practical purposes. The war had just broken out, World War II. Uh, it was 1942. And that's when I really was, before that, I know 
if I look back, it was real severe poverty. Uh, we lived in a very, what you'd call a, by today's day, a, a ghetto area of the city at the time. Uh, Roxbury was not known. You from Roxbury? Oh my God, who lives there? You know, and at the time we're talking 1940s. I was a little white ghetto surrounded by a, bl a large black ghetto in those days. It was World War II era. I, it's funny I remember the the, the USO. It was 1943, 44. The 43. Uh, they had a USO there. It was an all black USO. And the famous thing I do remember is he came with that. Lena Horne made an appearance there, and it was like a riot scene <laughs> because she made an appearance at that UO. It was only one block up the street. Uh, it's one of the few things I remember about that. So uh, you graduated um, from high school, what year? 1949. 1949, yeah. and, then, and then Korea. Did you have any um, sexual experiences in uh, the Army? Oh, uh, yeah. And so, so service was, uh, well, that was the era, even in after high school, I have to say. Had, and before high school, the only sexual events I had were usually on the crowded subways. <laughs> someone, someone sort of fondling. In, uh, in the Boston. Oh, in the Boston subways, yeah. They were, in those days, everybody pushed and shoved, they were crowded. I remember the day when I first came to New York, they don't have them anymore. They used to have pushes to push you on the subways. And you would be really crowded up against people, yeah. Yeah. And if you weren't, you could find a way to crowd. But after a while, I, I look forward to it, not <laughs> those days, because I was a young teen, preteen, and I was starting to feel my oats, so to speak. And so I was actually enjoying it, as long as I didn't have to make a commitment. <laughs> And your sense then, when a after the army and when you came to New York, was that you said unconsciously you think you may have been coming here so that because you knew you were so I could avoid any embarrassment to the family and free myself to that extent, because to me it was only a small part of my life that I was keeping secret, and that was my sex life, if there were, if you could call it a life, <laughs> my sexual. Inhibition, so to speak, uh, and uh, but you know, in the service, I did have one strange. Uh, I always remember it because I was in the Air Force in Korea, and we and we had to have guard duty along the perimeter of the the Air Force base, and uh, we patrolled the fence, the perimeter, and you'd have one section. You come up back then, and it was at night. It was from midnight to six o'clock. I think it was. I had to do it. And actually, we bumped into the guy coming to the other section, and we turn around and go back. By the night was over, we had had a sexual encounter. <laughs> Little did we know, <laughs> in the middle of Korea, on the midnight tour, I had a sexual encounter with another fellow. Wow. It was really, I still remember it to this day. Did you did you stay in touch with him after your service? No, it was all. We, we, I'm sure if we bumped any weather, in those days you would never acknowledge it happened. <laughs> Not even with a wink. <laughs> so the, the, the next day, was that the last time you saw him? That oh, I didn't even know who he was. He was probably from another section of the base. Uh, because it was by lottery that you sort of picked uh, guard duty. Yeah. It was, it was strange, but it was just a very unusual thing in the middle of the night. Yeah, we were built probably just very horny, and that was I was about 22 then. Yeah, yeah. That's neat. But it was exciting when I think back on it. Um, and it's the same way that when I came to New York, and when you found sex down here, it's different. Uh, well, let's 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 talk about that then. Let's let's uh, segue into coming to New York, 1960. 1960, yeah. 19. What month? No. See, I had, I got out of uh, high school in 1949, and I had odd jobs up until then there was the draft. The draft kicked in with the Korean War in 1950. So by 1952, I was ready to be drafted, so I enlisted. Uh, it was, cons uh, it wasn't, 
be a draftee was uh, not something people could hang their hat on, be proud of. You know, you say you wanted to say you enlisted, you know, and which is what I did. Big mistake. Cost me four years instead of two. <laughs> so it was four years in the Air Force. Yeah. And then when I get out, the good thing about it was, is that I got the GI Bill. Yeah. How did it, how did it cost you? Why would it have been two years? Oh, you only got drafted for two years. When you enlisted, you had to go for four years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was a big mistake I made in my early life, so to speak. Can't, can't undo it. <laughs> it was two years I lost. And uh, so, so by the time I got out of college, I was 29 years old. Yeah. And that was? Uh, 1960. 1960. Yeah. And so you came to New York. Came to New York. Did you have a job prospect? Or? Oh, no. I, I, I was interviewed in Boston by the firm, and I had already had a job. They wanted to hire me for the Boston office, but then they mentioned that, but we're also hiring for the New York office. And, uh, and they would arrange for me to come down here and be interviewed in the New York office, which I did. That day was very, uh, it was a whole different world. I tend to fly an airplane in 1960 from Boston to New York, it was still elegant. You know, they still served a meal in that hour flight down, and you still had stewardesses serving, waiting on you, and it was still very elegant to fly. And we came to New York, and they arranged for me, put us in a hotel, and then we were interviewed that day. They took us out to Delmonico's down in Wall Street for, for lunch, for an interview. It was very elegant. And so, I was very impressed with that, and and it was a I think a four hundred dollar differential in salary for a year, not a week. <laughs> four hundred dollar a year, so I think they were ordering uh, something like forty eight hundred dollars in New Boston and something like fifty two hundred dollars a year here in That's New an York. That's thirty five dollars or so a month. If if that. <laughs> But in that time, I imagine that was a chunk of change. Oh, well, yeah, only even when you, up until, oh, I'm going to say up until the 1980s, I guess it was, yeah. Around the 19, not, no, 1970s. A, a $2 a week raise was a big deal. I remember getting $2 a week raises, and I was, I was considered a, uh, an officer, a, a supervisor, you know. The time, yeah, God, that change has changed. Where did you move when you came to New York? What, what out in Queens, and uh, actually, I, I started out, believe it or not, at the YMCA, which was which was quite an introduction to New York. They were notorious gay hangouts, <laughs> both both the bathrooms and everything else in the YMCA. They were wild. Which YMCA was? I it? went to the worst one, notorious was the Sloan House on 42nd Street, and I think it's 8th and 9th Avenue. No, 34th Street. 34th Street on 8th and 9th Avenue. It's known as the Sloan House. I think it's an apartment house now, today. But it was notorious in 1960. So notorious that when the firm I was with on Wall Street found out where I was staying, they immediately made a reservation for me at the Uptown YMCA on the west side because they knew the reputation, the one on 34th Street. I didn't. I just went, I, coming from Boston, I just stayed at a place that was convenient for me, uh, something safe. I thought the YMCA is safe, of course. I didn't know they were gay at the time. I had no idea of that. I just, I just fell into it. And, uh, but they switched me to the Upper West Side. Why? Which was even gayer. Oh, a, a little, a little more upscale. It wasn't, it wasn't as raunchy. <laughs> a little more upscale, <laughs> but same, same thing. Were, were so, you having any? Were you having sex? Oh yes, but only, only bathroom sex in the, in the bathroom because they were public. Uh, you shared a bathroom on the floor, so, and your showers and everything else. You went to the shower, and that's where everything happened. <laughs> yeah, but and then you can find out if they were in the same room or what. You got a little more intimate there, I would say. But again, I was not that intimate. I hadn't got to that stage yet. 
Did anybody at that time, was anybody um, self-identifying as gay or homosexual? No. Okay. We're still, we're still very closeted. Uh, I think it was just more, I think most of us thought of it, I'm going to speak to myself for what I observed. Uh, there was, nothing was that flamboyant, openly, you know. It was all a case of, of if I remember when a priest saying once, the eyes have it, right? You could look at somebody and tell just by looking that they were gay. And so, well, yeah, that's true, even on the street today. You can walk by and the eyes connect and you know, oops, I made a connection. And nobody knows how that happens, but it does. <laughs> And it was the same way in the shower. You could tell right in the middle of the shower whether the guy next to you was gay. <laughs> Just by looking at how he, his whole body language told you. Yeah. When did you first come? So in 1960 you're here. You moved into this apartment in 67. I, uh, no, this place. I was in Queens for seven years. For seven moved years. around again with a lot of straight guys. Mostly the guys I worked with in the accounting firm that I worked with down down in uh, Wall Street. It was it was Arthur Anderson, the famous Arthur Anderson, who went bankrupt. Uh, um, actually, they were sued. Uh, but uh, we we uh, they were all young men in their twenties, and and we would room together one or two. I started out with one fella, and then. We spent a summer in uh, Long Island with two or three, four straight guys. We shared a place out in uh, Long Beach, on Long Beach for summer. Then we came back and I lived in different sections of Queens, all closeted, living with a straight roommate or roommates. And, uh, and mo most of the sexual outlet in those days, and that's what I grew up with, were movie houses. The men's room in the movie house or even in the audience, you know. You could always find uh, uh, gay sex in movie houses. Do you remember any of them in Queens that you would go to? Uh, yeah, one was in Jackson Heights on 82nd Street. Uh, the other one was, uh, I think, one in Astoria. But it didn't matter where it was. If there was a movie house, there was the, the, the men's rooms were gay. That's where gay people congregated, and that's where you met one another. I don't mean everybody was gay, but that's how you found one another, was in the men's room. And always, if you'd be in the men's room, in the middle of the movie, what were you doing there? <laughs> you didn't do, just not just at the intermission. And this was, I don't care whether you're in Boston, whether you're in San Francisco, no matter where you were, this was notorious. Movie houses, it's like any men's room. I used to, I've discussed this so many with gay people over the years. The straight world, male world, all knew what was going on in bathrooms. They all knew it. They couldn't be ignorant. And yet, on gay conversation, on, on male conversation, straight, the subject never came up among straight men. And yet they all knew what was going on. Mm. But they never mentioned bathrooms and what was going on. But they knew it because it was so open. And they never confronted when, if they were, came into the bathroom? No, the only time they would is uh, if you get somebody who's looking for trouble, what you call gay bashing. You know, that, that once in a great while you run into that. I ran into it once in Macy's of all places. I ran into a guy and it, well, he wasn't gay bashing, but he was imitating a policeman showing a badge. And he was going to take you in and report you. And he, what he did, he wanted money. <laughs> and he did this to you? Oh, uh, yeah. It was the only time I got caught like that. Did you? I, I paid. Well, yeah, because that was the. It's hard to describe in this day and age what that ironclad closet was like. You would do anything because you were automatically guilty and you were wrong whenever you were caught. That's, that's the best way I can describe it. You, 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 there was, it's, it borders on cowardice almost, is what it all actually bordered on. But it's something every gay man in that ever would have told you that if you were caught, you were wrong and you were guilty. And you knew it in your, in your, in your, 
There was no such thing as fighting back. And you felt guilty. Oh yeah, felt and you, your tendency was to run, not to fight back. So um, you, you had. That's why the gay bashes had such an uh, an advantage. I used to see it down here on the piers. There were maybe 50 gay guys down on the pier, and one straight gay basher would scare the hell out of all of them when they knew he was outnumbered 50 to 1. That's, that's, that's how I, I try to explain something. Don't try to explain. He can't explain what the closet was like, that ironclad closet of being exposed. For instance, my job and my 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 whole uh, ability to support myself was was in jeopardy if that one guy in the in the bathroom uh, got hold of him because he got hold of my ID and he could expose me to everything and anything. So during those years, you had straight friends. You had gay sex. I had straight friends and gay sex. But yeah. You didn't have gay friends that yeah. you hung out with. No, no gay friends. No gay friends. In fact, I don't know. There were, uh, when I was in, uh, I was not a drinker then either, by the way. I didn't drink at all. So I didn't socialize in gay bars. Uh, I had heard they existed. In fact, when one place in the Queens I lived was, uh, I could go for sex if I wanted to right outside my building, where I had my apartment where I lived. And I lived in single homes where they, broken into apartments. And little did I know, again, I didn't know where I was moving. I moved, I think it was uh, 76th Street, something like that, in Jackson Heights. Oh, that's, I know what that is. Uh, and I moved with, right next to what they call Vaseline Alley. I heard about that for years. <laughs> Go on, sorry. It's at 72nd Street, it's actually 74th Street, and it runs from, I think, 70, one block from 74th Street to 73rd Street, and it's one block off of Roosevelt Avenue. And I lived at 74th Street, two blocks south of Roosevelt Avenue. It was right about, in fact, my landlord lived on the corner of Vaseline Alley. And I didn't know about that. But before I ever moved there, they said, one block away, was one of the most famous early gay bars called the Floridora. And you can imagine that must have been really a drag bar with the name Floridora. And they said it was notorious. And I was there in, uh, I guess it was uh, still 1960. Might have been still be, yeah, was, was it? no, it would have been 61. It was 61, it would have been there. So they said it predated my being there. But they said the guys would come out and, and they would go right around the corner into Vaseline Alley and that's how they scored after the bar let out and everything else. And, and here it was, I gather, five, ten years after the bar closed, gay people still went to Vaseline Alley to score. Is, uh, and actually it's a meeting place more than anything. Is it just on the street? Is it a strip of the street? Yeah, you walk the street. Obviously, that's what the guys did after they come out of the bar. They walked behind, it was a, a behind, in other words, behind uh, Roosevelt Avenue was one block south of it, and they walked the one or two blocks, what it was, actually, it was actually two blocks, I think, from the bar. And that's where they would bump and meet. And meet. Yeah. This, is, this is the first time I've ever had anybody describe to me Vaseline yeah. Alley. I've yeah. heard about it. Yeah. All my since I was a teenager, yeah. I, I have a cousin. She's ninety-two, and she's lived at seventy-fourth off of, off of thirty-seventh since the forties. She has her her uh, rent control department too. Yeah. Okay, that's and very close. So she's at seventy-fourth. I think thirty-seventh is the next avenue after Roosevelt, isn't yes. it? Yeah. So that would be that one block. Well, this was a this was not a full block. It was just one house, so that's why they called it an alley. It was one house, but it was a street. It had sidewalks, I remember. It was a street, and 
what the buildings on Roosevelt Avenue, the backs of them were behind this, what it was. That's why they called it an alley as opposed to a street. Gotcha. Yeah. And that is Vaseline Alley. That's Vaseline Alley. And I think I'm right with the street, 74th Street. And it runs from 74th to 73rd and probably 72nd of 70, I say 74th to 75th, that would be. No, it runs the other way. 75, 74, 73. The one I knew was 74 to 73. Yeah. And I think they said uh, uh, the, uh, the bar was on 75th. So what brings you then to Greenwich Village? Oh, that's the period. Uh, after living there almost seven years, I lived in uh, around Jackson Heights. I met a fella. A big hangout was the bus stop, the bus station at 72nd Street Subway. The bus station, well, that was also a big hangout for gay people. They would hang out around there, and you could pick up and bump into people. And I lived right around the corner from it. And I bumped into a fella there, and we hit it off. We had, that period, I would take people back to my apartment. When my roommate, who was at the time was Philadelphia, he went away for weekends back to Philadelphia as a place to myself. I could bring people back. And that's where I met, who eventually became my first, we call them lovers in those days. Uh, but that took a while to develop. But he lived, uh, I think, in, uh, out further in Queens. Uh, my, my senior moments. Uh, but he lived further out in Queens. And he would come back and forth, and we finally hit it off. We'd go out to dinner, and, and we hit one another. One, uh, we'd see one another much more often. Was, so this was your face, first gay involvement? First gay involvement, yeah. First gay involvement. Real involvement. Uh, I did have a couple of episodes in Boston when I was going to college. I was serious, but never, never saw the same person twice. Was, uh, what was your, your, I'm sorry, your boyfriend's name here in, uh, uh, in Queens? Well, I prefer just call his name was Bob. Bob. <laughs> How many Bobs has been in my life that I've known? Roberts and Bobs, I avoid them at this stage. <laughs> I, in fact, I make the mistake and say, oh my God, that's the bane of my life, Roberts. <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, it was at his intro, we tried an, an apartment. Oh, I was... I was caught almost red-handed with a number in my apartment I had brought back from Boston for a weekend. It was a young fella, and we had we have a great sex, so I talked to him. I thought I'd bring him back and show him a little of New York. And I was caught, and at the time my roommate showed up. <laughs> and I, actually, I weren't doing anything, but he was sitting in my lap. <laughs> oh, yeah. Heavens. And uh, so I decided we decided to break up. Actually, he put me out. He, he couldn't stand it. And the, the trouble is, I think, in the long run, he, he was gay and very closeted. But in those days, if you were guilty, you were guilty. <laughs> and besides, I wasn't ready. And that's so I moved in. By this time, I was seeing this fellow off and on. And uh, uh, we just, he decided he wanted to move in, and we got together. It was time for him to move out. I, I know it's his, his mother died, his stepmother, was, no, his foster mother died. He was a foster child. And uh, so we moved in together in an apartment in Queens, but that wasn't working out. We were shopping. We, always com we were commuting. If you lived in Queens in those days and you wanted a real gay life, you came to the village to see what it was. In fact, I remember the first time we came to the village, we saw the Mattachine Society handing out you know, uh, instructions on how what to uh, what to do if the police stop you or do anything. They were fascinating. They were all dressed in suit and ties, very formal. <coughs> great, great organization. They were the beginning of it all. They were really the beginning. As you mentioned, they were the ones that went to Julius's, and it was the Mattachine Society that did that and challenged them. They, they refused to serve them. Uh, because they were gay, because I think they, they told them they're gay and they would like a drink and they refused them. And they won that case in court that they had to serve them. <clears throat> and and the, the law changed only to a degree that 
They couldn't put you out unless there was sexual activity. They had to serve you as long as you weren't being sexually active. And so that was a long time before they went beyond to get to the sexual activity part that they couldn't serve. Yeah, I said I forgot all about the fact that while living around the corner from Vaseline Alley, one time, and this was at the time I met my new friend that I was having an affair with, uh, we were walking up Vaseline Alley, not intending any other purpose but taking a shortcut up to the subway, when two young uh, teenage uh, uh, muggers, so to speak, they were looking for trouble, they bumped into us, and uh, my... <coughs> They got, they got hold of me because I was a small one. My friend was over six feet tall. He ran off, and I, and they, they started, uh, and they punched me or something. And I, and then they, 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 uh, <coughs> they tried, they started assaulting me. And one of them, I, I actually grabbed one of them. He tried to kick me, and I picked it up, and uh, uh, we had a big fight. And uh, they ran off after they kicked me, and I, I ended up in the doctor's office the next day. Uh, making sure I didn't have a concussion. But then, uh, another time, I was going on my way home very innocently again in the same area. And it get, by this time, uh, your, uh, your, your gay bashers knew about the Vaseline Alley, obviously, and I was living so close to it. So when I was coming home, I didn't know where I was going, but anyway, I was running from somebody because I knew they were trouble. And, I, and running from them, because they, they were chasing me, I fell. And, uh, and they they just kept going. I guess somebody was. I got away fast enough, but in the, in the process, I broke an arm. So that was another session. I I broke an arm and ended up in the hospital twice. I was gay bashed in Vaseline, in and around Vaseline Alley. So eventually, we decided that we we had been visiting the village on a regular basis for for a, a gay culture, so to speak, and uh, to get out to. And uh, we started looking around and uh, realized when my lease was up, we had shared an apartment there for two years. My lease was up, we decided we wanted to move into the village. But everything we looked at was so expensive. But then we moved, we kept walking, and we finally found down here on Christopher Street, we were walking towards the thing. And I, oh, I know, it was an ad in the village paper, the village voice, and it, uh, the Christopher House on Christopher Street. Uh, and uh, we come down here, and this is where it was, 165 Christopher Street, Christopher House, and they were advertising apartments. Now, <laughs> that's not, uh, you, in those days there was still ads in the paper for apartments, but this was off the beaten track in those days, west of Houston Street, H H when I say Hudson Street, rather, west of Hudson Street, where nobody ever seemed to go, it was all, it was all uh, the, the waterfront and trucking and very industrialized. And, but we saw that it was a brand new building. It was only two years old. And, we, and I come in. We were going to look at the building. <clears throat> and the rent was right, what they told us. I think it was, a, I think it was 250 a month, if I remember right. It might, might have been less than that. I'm not sure. And, uh, but when I come in, we're going to show... The elevator opened, and there's this six-foot, gorgeous hunk of man draped in leather with a V torso getting off the elevator. And I looked at the guy who jumped and I said, I'm taking this apartment. <laughs> it was just, he was just out of a magazine. And later found out he was a model for the leather man up here on Christopher Street, the leather man shop. He was their model. I always remember his name is Tom, I remember. But he was also a, an escort, a gay escort. Because <laughs> he used to be picked up. To me, this was all eye-opening. I didn't know this life existed. He was a gay escort. The limousines would pick him up every night. <laughs> and boy, he deserved it. I have to say, though, I once scored with him eventually. <laughs> That's when, and when I moved into the building, and that's this building. This building. Once you, and at the time, I didn't know, but its nickname was Leather Flats because there was only two bars in the neighborhood at that time that were, quote, gay, and they were, quote, leather bars. 
One was Keller's, which is one block west of here on the, on the strip, on the west side strip. And the other one was called the Destroyer's Den, was up on Little West 12th Street. That was the other leather bar. And any night after 11, 12 o'clock, you would see the traffic draped in leather walking from Keller's to Destroyer's Den and vice versa along Washington Street because there was no houses down here. It was all trucking. And again, the truckers, and that was another thing, the truckers all were all in for whatever sex they could find themselves. They were not necessarily all gay, but they were always uh, in the mood for a blowjob once in a while. It was not my scene. <laughs> but this is how I got introduced to the bars. And uh, it was something I never did eventually. A few times I went to bars, but not gay bars, you know. Although when I was in Queens, there was a peculiar situation out there that the bars would change every week of which bar was gay. And it was only the, the gay uh, grapevine that would tell you what's in this week. <laughs> That's again, it's all very closeted, very closeted. Even here in the village. What was the environment like in the village at the time? Um, what drew you to it? It was primarily the well, culture, but... they did have uh, what you call uh, when, when my, the partner at the time that I was we were getting together with, and we were going to move in. We moved in together. When we came, we came here a couple of times. We heard about these quote gay restaurants. You went to restaurants that catered to a gay clientele, and you could tell they were gay because you went in, all the tables were men. <laughs> And so, and I used to call, and I said, even the vegetables are gay because they were the vegetables I didn't like. <laughs> oh. What's the, the little uh, cabbages? What? Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. Was, I always called that the gay vegetable. <laughs> it was not one of my favorites. Broccoli was another one I didn't like. It was another one of the favorite ones. <laughs> but the atmosphere was worth it. It was a gay atmosphere. You could relax and... And it was much more elegant and much more closeted, even in the restaurant. But it was, an, it was a comfortable atmosphere to be gay. And I think that's basically what the village was like. It was still, it was not open in your face on the streets till much later. It was well after, well after Stonewall, I would say. Uh, but before that, it was just, Everybody knew what was the gay areas, what weren't because just by walking the street, you could tell. And that was not necessarily true down here so much, but you knew as soon as you crossed Hudson Street down here, eventually, this building was unbelievable, the, the reputation it had in those days after I moved in. You could sit out front here and on an average weekend, or even a warm summer spring day, you could score three, four, five times a day if you wanted to. Because eventually the reputation got out. Christopher Street was gay. I don't know how it ever got the reputation. So <clears throat> was your understanding of yourself evolving through this time too? To I am, I am one of these people I, yes, I, have, I had to realize it was my sexual outlet and that I was, quote, gay, but did I admit it to myself? Is still, there's still a hesitancy there to say, you know, I know, I think up until about the time I met Bob, there was still some inkling that, that when I grew up, there was always, it's, it's a phase you will get over. You know, if you marry a good woman, you'll get over it, that type of thing. Well, that never attracted me. I never, never did. And I never, thank God I never got involved like so many people did. They got into marriages to try to, to, try to cure themselves and found themselves, you know, involved in something that wasn't them at all. And even some of them even had children to boot. And that, that's something I'm glad I never got caught up in. Talk 
to me about <clears throat> the bars, the environment in the bars at that time. If there was any, if there was any harassment um, in the bars here, the, the cops. Not down here this far, and I think, <clears throat> I think in the only. Uh, there were, I gather, before that, before I got down here, there were, again, there were certain bars that were known, even up into the Times Square area. Uh, I, it was before my time, there was a an, an whole circle of bars that were, they were called, the, the uh, they were named after birds, the peacock and this, that, the other thing. And, the, the, and the, there was a, Clay went up, it was named after a bird, it was probably gay, that type of thing. But down here, <coughs> It was all just grapevine that would have told you that Keller's was a gay, was a leather bar down here on the waterfront, and the destroyer's den. This was a clique of people who knew about it. In fact, that's what I say. This building had a nickname called the Le the, Le the Leather Flats, and it was. It was, it was. There was actually a club that I actually went to once of all these leather people who. It was called the Black and Blue Club. And they wore a black and blue patch on their leather jackets. I went to it once. It was a brownstone they had somewhere. And that was a little, a bit, a bit wild once you went in there. <laughs> but uh, again, you had to go with a member, so to speak. Did you, <clears throat> did you ever go into Stonewall? Yeah. No, I never was in Stonewall. I, I don't. I only had heard about it, but I had known it only as a drag bar. That's all I had known it as. And uh, I didn't know that much about it again because drag was not my scene at all. But it was my understanding that's what it was mainly known as a drag bar. Because even uh, the night of Stonewall, because uh, well, by this point, I, said, I told you I didn't drink up till I moved down there. Then I got involved into the bar scene. Then I got into a, a drinking scene uh, to eventually became one of my problems. So <clears throat> there was a number of bars that opened and people forget there was Kellers down here. Then you had, I forget, the Ramrod and then you had and then, then the Sneakers and then the West Beach and Peter Rabbit. This was known as the Strip with about five or six gay bars which developed and that was that was pre Stonewall and, and post Stonewall, all that around. All, it's all muddled in the same history as, as it boomed down here. I don't know if you remember the big shooting down here. Was that, was that the, not the Ramrod, I forget the name of it down here. There was a famous uh, drive by shooting in the gay bar that was uh, in the, I believe that was the early 70s, might have been around 1970, 71, 72. And uh, there was a number of gay people shot with some nutcase drove by shooting into the bar. And uh, I don't know if you got that much. It's got to be in the, in the history of the, uh, of, of the gay, gay community center somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. And that, I don't know if that was post Stonewall or around the same period. No. What do you remember around that time, Stonewall? What, what was your, your sense of what was going on, what was going on? In Until the Stonewall, it was very much as I've described so far, still very closeted, and the only people who knew about the West Village down here as such were gay people. And to me, I used to say to people, if you walk past Hudson Street on Christopher Street, you had better be gay because that was basically although we did have straight people that lived in the building. And there was still always, what you call, travel, travelers with us. But down here was strictly gay, and the piers were all gay even during the day, especially in the summertime for sunbathing. Uh, they were still coming down here and, and hang out. Oh, and oh, I forgot, famous trucks. Everybody forgets the trucks, I remember them vividly. The, before there was a park down here on the West Side Highway, all the trucking parked underneath the West Side Highway and up against the uh, shoreline. And what would happen with the trucks is when the bars got out, as I told you by this time, they had developed along the strip. There was another more famous one up on, on Jane Street. Uh, 
and, but they would come out after the bars closed and before they closed, after midnight. The trucks became very active. They would park the trucks down there at night, all empty with nothing in the back. And people always climbed in the back to, take, to have what you call community sex, basically, is what it was. And it was all in dark, very uh, anonymous sex, but in the dark. I loved it. <laughs> Not everybody, it wasn't everybody's cup of tea. But I love that. There's that sense. Uh, there's that sense of illicit forbiddenness that made it that much more exciting. And uh, but you mentioned before, I don't remember any raids as such, the bars as such. And in those days, I think uh, the, the the bars were heavily uh, run by the mafia, and. Uh, they were paying off the police, which is all part of the scene with, with uh, Stonewall. It seems it seems there was something went awry there, and some section of the police department was not getting their cut. So that's why the raid came about, in my understanding, as it was written up anyway. But I didn't know much about the Stonewall. I do remember the night of Stonewall. I was getting drunk, and as, as, as my drinking had progressed at this point, and I was getting drunk at uh, the bar up the street. Um, I don't remember the name of it. And it was a famous bar at the time. By this time, the bars all had a reputation, because it was 1969, and the bars had been proliferated. Uh, I don't remember the name of the bar. My, my senior. Senior moments when it comes to the bars, but by that time there was about five or six bars in the neighborhood. And my favorite watering hole up there. And I remember I would be getting drunk and be later in the evening after work. And I remember this one night because some people would come in the corner, the queens are rioting up the street, they're rioting up the street. Didn't think much of it. It was just the next day I had heard what was going on here. And I went up and took a look at that, and the, the square was a mess with with trash cans and everything else and glass and what have you. And that's what I had heard. And, they, and again, I said, they heard the queens were rioting. It was, it was no butch numbers that I remember taking credit for it. You know, it was, and from that day, I always remember it was the queens who started it all. <laughs> because they always, they, they were always the bravest. I have to say that about drag queens. They were always the bravest, just to do what they do openly. <laughs> the the next day, do you remember people talking about it? Yeah, in fact, it was not just the next day, it was the next few weeks. It, it didn't really settle in, but you knew what something was going on and the whole gay community was all, well, let's say all exposed. We were now in the papers. The village and everything was going on down here was basically we were suddenly exposed like an open sore, so to speak. But it, it's the progress of that has all started out of this. And what I do remember after that was there were other raids that came after it. Uh, they they, uh, they, they, they became much more frequent the raids because of that exposure. And I don't know if people remember this that. They would raid and arrest people and bring them over. The 6th Precinct used to be right over here on Charles Street. And uh, the famous story was uh, a young boy was, uh, jumped out the window and, and impaled himself on the fence of the 6th Precinct. And that was, Mayor Lindsay was the mayor at the time. And a lot of people didn't realize Mayor Lindsay had a gay brother. And... Uh, his gay brother, I understand, used to go to one of the other bars up on on uh, Tenth Street, I think it was. Yes, I used to know the name of all these bars. My mind, my memory is going on me. And they don't exist anymore. What was what was the sense, or what is your memory of the sense of the gay world or the gay community? I don't even know if they're you know yeah. that, that That's, term was used yet, but. After no, the gay community was not used as such. Like you said, I told, the Gay Liberation Front was formed during this period. The Gay Activist Alliance, and 
That's, that was when that, that was sort of the political and uh, activist end of it. Got very active, and you know there was a, a from my part there was a, a vacillation of whether this was right or wrong or where was this going. And I can remember one old gay friend of mine used to say, "Be careful of these people who are so tolerant. Young people are so tolerant. Get remember they get older and they get married, and they don't stay that tolerant." Yeah. So there was that iffy about should you come out. This was the coming out era. That was the famous trying to get everybody to come out. I still wasn't convinced that was it because I still had a job that no way I could come out in. <laughs> By this time, I had a very good job. I was no longer with uh, the accounting firm. I was with uh, I was with Lever Brothers on Park Avenue, and I had a very, very decent job there. So, so the idea of gay liberation and coming out and let's all be who we are yeah. wasn't exactly you were thinking oh, about no, it. Oh, no, I wasn't even thinking about it. I, 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 in fact, I, never, I can honestly say I never really, quote, came out. I was living in a gay community. I was living a gay life. And uh, even if someone asked me, I would say, what is none of your business, <laughs> basically. But I never, I never said to anybody, I'm not gay, per se. But I never really came out, neither to my family, either. I never really had to come out. Remember, I had six brothers and sisters. I had one gay brother. My younger brother turned out gay, too. In fact, he was a bartender at the biggest gay bar in Boston. <laughs> and, uh, but my, my other brothers sort of, they knew and sort of accepted without without mentioning it. I had one older brother once say that to me <clears throat> when my younger brother died and uh, get sick. He said, well, he said, you know what you guys are. He said, you, you, you made your choices, is the way he put it. <laughs> you made your choices. And I, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even argue that point with him, but that was his acknowledgement to me that he knew I was gay and I just let it go. And I'm sure that came through his wife more than him. She, she was, women are so much more tolerant when it comes to gay men. I find that's not 100% not of the time, but they're much more defensive. And uh, my other brother, he always just, he just never wanted to know. And I have a sister, 94-year-old sister to this day, who had a gay son, my nephew, who never came out to her, and she never acknowledged it. To this day, if I even mention the word gay or anything gay, she changes the subject. She can't deal with it, and I won't force her to deal with it. Because at 94 years old, what, what do you do to something? You don't do that. And even at 80 years old, she wasn't all her life. And when she couldn't do it with her son, she couldn't, I mean, her son was gay and he died. And she never knew. I never acknowledged, I shouldn't say never knew, never acknowledged that he was gay. Did, did he die of HIV? No, he died of a uh, aneurysm. He was a <coughs> very sudden, a very young man. He was just about 30 years old. <coughs> did you know anybody who was at the Stonewall Inn at that? Um, Not closely, no. I've heard of people. I met people who had been, yeah. And what was your sense of the village after that? How did the village change? That's when it really evolved after 60, because that was 69. And <clears throat> you, could, you could say that the whole gay sex evolved after that. All these underground bars and overnight bars, all the ones that eventually basically were the, the hotbeds of HIV and, and AIDS. Uh, that's, that's how they all developed. The sex world just went crazy during the 70s. The 70s, gay sex was just any way you wanted it, any kind you wanted it, as often as you wanted it. The 70s were just, we'll never, we'll never see that again anywhere, thank God. Because I'm a little, we, we were our own worst enemies and didn't know it. Because it was uh, unbelievable. You could have sex any time you wanted. That was never an issue. Because you had, you had gay 
not gay bars, and you had the, the gay clubs, the gay baths. The gay baths were notorious, and they were opening all over the, the country. The gay baths, and that was a big place where the HIV and the AIDS took place. Because there were people who would stay there, they would stay there for weekends. Did you feel yourself to be part of the gay sexual revolution? Oh, in that sense, I, I, I loved the bars. I mean, I loved the baths. I loved the baths. They were, great. they were a great way to just completely unwind for a day. Uh, it was just fantastic. What was the one that Bette Midler used to sing at? Oh, I never went to that one. That was the one uptown on, on 72nd Continental. Street. Continental. Continental, yeah. I never went. I always heard about it. I knew all the guys. That was the gay set I was never really a part of. Uh, I would almost call it the, the nightclub gay set. I was never into the dancing gay set either. There were some people who knew it, mainly because it was drugs. I was never into drugs. Uh, alcohol, yes. But I never could, thank God, never got into drugs. And that was a big drug era. Because they used to say that the pills were rolling on the dance floor. Yeah. And they had dance halls opening all over the place. They were on the west side, they were east side, west side, wherever you went. Prior to that, as I said, it was much more elegant with the gay restaurants. There were quite a few famous ones on the Upper East Side as well. And they, they were more open in those days. They could get more and more open. Did, did you feel, it, so, it's, it sounds like you feel like one of the um, clearest effects of the Stonewall riots and gay liberation was sex, sexual activity, whenever and wherever. Was there anything else about gay liberation that seemed to maybe foster community? Or oh yeah, well, I think I think what what the uh, so what really started was not the acceptance of maybe part of the acceptance of being gay, but it gave us a sort of a, a publicity. That we never that we existed where most of society was in denial about homosexuality, not only about that it existed, but that how far and and how widespread gay life was. You know that people find eventually, even like to today, almost everybody could tell you they have someone in their family or somebody they know who is gay and living outright, and this sort of. It was the beginning of people acknowledging gay, and, and the coming out process was developed out of this, but even the acknowledging that gay life existed, which up until that, all of society was in denial. I mean, it was so secretive and closeted, even gay people were in denial. Um, I always tell people that that's what the closet was all about. You would deny you were doing what you were doing, even if you were caught doing it. Very much like a straight man who's caught uh, in sex by his wife. That's not what we were doing. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. You, you were caught doing anything. You denied that what you were doing. Sure. That That's how sense. deep the closet was. As the 70s <clears throat> rolled along after Stovall, at, at first there was um, the discussion of whether you should come out. You, well, that was a big was issue, that, yeah. You know, My decision was I had no, no pressure to come out. I, I was not in that area. I, again, I was, so talk about, I was in my 40s. Uh, <clears throat> I was not a young kid. Uh, I, I, I didn't have to answer to my family. My family was all up in Boston. Uh, so the coming out issue uh, for me would all, always have been economic. My job, could I come out of that? And that was, that would be the last place anybody would want to come out with and, and, and jeopardize their, their living. So, so you, at, at work, you remained in the oh, yeah. closet, but you would be able to come home to your community. Oh yeah, once, once I left work, I was, I was a gay man again. But I didn't think of that as a gay man. I just think I was free 
<laughs> it was, I, it was, you leave to do double life. I think everybody does anyway. Everybody, everybody, you're a different person at home with your family than you are once you go out onto the street. It's two, two different personas, always. And according to what group you're with, it's a different persona. I think that's true of everybody. Sure. Yeah. Sure. On balance, what would you say were the pros of the Stonewall um, riots? What well, that's what I, what I just told you. The, yeah. the open publicity that it, we, there was no shame in being gay anymore. It was, it was a personal thing, to be sure, whether you wanted to come out. But there was no shame in it as such, unless you were in a certain society that it was shameful. You know, maybe in a religious background or something like that, or even on your job. Because uh, eventually I did leave my job, and uh, that was in, uh, when did I leave? 1973, 1973 I left. I just put in 10 years with Lever Brothers. And part of that was just, part of it was getting sober. I got sober at the same time. I, I really have a drinking problem up until then. And I got sober and I just took a look at my life. I was well in my 40s. And I said, I don't want to sit here and earn a, a gold watch in 40 years, so. I, I moved out and went out on my own, and I sort of freelanced. And I did that for quite a number of years till I retired. Freelanced. Had jobs off and on in the accounting field. Did you feel that you were able to be more out once you were um, your own Yeah, I, I, thought, I felt that's one of the reasons why I left Lever Brothers. I found that was too closeted an, uh, an atmosphere to live in, to work in. And that was a whole part of my life. That was eight, eight to ten hours a day. That was... I was literally forced to be in a closet. Once I left there, I could freelance on my own. And, uh, and, and it wasn't that I wanted to tell everybody I was gay, but I was just free to worrying about anybody accusing me of being gay like it was a sin. <laughs> Let me get that. That's driving me crazy. Oh, the, um, no, I, oh, oh. So we're, we're running again. It's interesting because even though at the very moment of Stonewall, the, the considerations came up of, you know, come out, come out, wherever yeah. you are, that wasn't where you felt yourself to be able to be at that moment, but with the passage no, I was, of time... I was very conservative about that, because I didn't believe that, you know, that, that it was going to be that accepting, you know, like, like, I gather most of the people in that movement I had nothing to lose. They were young people. They weren't established anywhere. Uh, and some of them were college kids. Uh, and uh, I just said it was a whole different element. And uh, it was a different decision. And I think it is a personal decision for everybody to come out. When you, when you out somebody, you're really not doing them a favor. Uh, you're really, it's very hurtful to out somebody against their will. It's something they should do on their own. But with the evolution of the <coughs> movement and gay consciousness, you do end up making the decision to feel more free in your own. Oh, I, I never deny it to anybody anymore. Uh, much more. In fact, in fact, I remember saying, saying to an older friend of mine who's about twenty years on me years ago, I said, I, I say. What are you worried about at your age? <laughs> and I said, and I'm at that age now, but I can understand anybody who's in 30 and 40 and in a position now where that's, that would be an issue even today. That he wouldn't, and I could respect that, where they're coming from. I can re, and I think that's very important to, for me, I said that, there's, and today we wouldn't call it a closet as much as we would say, it's 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 a it's a it's an honest decision you make for your life, you know. At, at this time, I, I'm not not about to uh, cross that line. I, I see it, I see it in my own life still. My my husband is a um, 
teacher to seventh graders. Of course, South it doesn't need to be out, right? Um, and it, you know, there's a little bit of duplicitousness, but you know, there are other people who are gay, and he wonders, he considers to himself um, what he should say or shouldn't say, um, and. You know, in my life at Columbia, I'm out, but I will every, you know, I got married in front of my father and friends, you know, I've done all of these yeah. things that are out, and then every now and then I'll find myself in a situation where I don't quite say who I am because I'm navigating mm. either my own mm. um, um, self-preservation or perhaps a little bit inner uh, leftover self homophobia, wondering about what the repercussion might yeah, be, yeah. even if it's just like, oh, I didn't know you. Were, you know, so I still have that. This is too. Well, it's the same thing. The same thing you're trying to tell somebody who lives in Keokuk, Iowa, to come out. <laughs> you don't know what atmosphere you talk. But to me, it all comes down to the word out. It has a different meaning, even to everybody. It, right. Out. Everybody is out to a different extent. I'm out, but if I wouldn't be out like someone else is in their own family at home, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even come up for discussion. Right. But my it's funny. The generation after me are much more liberal. It's not discussed, but they know I'm their gay uncle. They know at this point. I don't have to say, you know, I am your gay uncle. I don't have to wear it on a lapel. Everybody knows I'm, I'm 88 years old and. Never had a girlfriend, and a couple of them knew I've had boyfriends. <laughs> it's the I've only had two quote lovers in my life. And the, the first one is the first one. We broke up when he went into the seminary to become a priest, <clears throat> and he has since married and had children. <clears throat> and it's a long story. And that's when I broke up with him when he when he decided to become a priest, and we broke. He actually. He, we'd broken up before that. He was seeing other people and, and what have you. But <clears throat> we had spent 10 years together. It was a very strange relationship. Very strange. I always say it was a one-sided one on my part. <clears throat> but, but And the second one was just a, sort of a whirlwind, but it's the one I always said was the real love of my life. And he died a young man, too, of stomach cancer. Yeah. And this was all in the middle of the AIDS crisis. <laughs> he died right in the middle, but he died of stomach cancer. <clears throat> and he was like 44 years old, something like that. <clears throat> Maybe this is um, interesting to talk about yeah. your, your, the two lovers you had. Maybe this is an interesting, good point to wrap it up. Because uh -huh. um, we've gone on like an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, and uh, what will happen is we'll get a transcript to you yeah. at a certain point, um, so you can look through it, and then we can think about other areas to cover. Okay, sure, if you want to go to another interview, it's all right with me.